day, a summer day in Newport, Rhode Island. Yeah. And uh, as you just mentioned, a lusty British roadster. It is, it is and, lusty. Uh, and this one is quite rare. People looking at it might think it's a TR4A, but this is actually something called a TR5, isn't that correct? A TR5 PI, thank you very much, petrol injection. Right. The uh, This car was the first series production British car with fuel injection. Oh, and uh, right? they were quite proud of the fact and uh, loudly proclaimed it with the uh, badge on the boot. So you're driving a pie, that's exactly, something. Exactly, a pie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, of course, one of my favorite English roadsters because, of course, you know quite well that I love all things Italian. And uh, this is designed by, of course, by the great Giovanni Michelotti. This, to me, is the best. I, I have a TR3 that belonged to my brother. Mm -hmm. And I have a later TR6 that uh, was given to me as a uh, an engine car with a blown engine. I, I enjoyed putting that back together and driving it. But my favorite is still this Michelotti body one from 196, the 4A IRS. That was the ideal one. This one, of course, it, it midway between the five and the six, six. right? Mm -hmm. This has not the four cylinder, the, the six, six cylinder, cylinder engine, engine with, well, not three carburetors, but three injectors, I right. guess you call it. And uh, 155 horsepower, the highest horsepower, a big block, as we'd say in America. <laughs> exactly. And it drives quite well. It's very nice. The only thing these cars are missing was power. Could have used a little more power, and this one seems to. And yet it was never sold in America, is that correct? That is correct. And uh, one of the things that's very interesting, too, um, I have to respectfully um, disagree with you as the former owner of a TR4, an early TR4. Yeah. I actually like the live axle TR4 better than the IRS. Well, you know, that's interesting because I've read that from an awful lot of people. I've never driven an IRS, and I assumed that it was too complicated or whatever, because it seemed like, wow, you know, British bus cars are really getting sophisticated now with, you know, injection. And that, and yeah, I, that was it. I think it was more about the marketing, thinking about where the competition had gone by the time you get to the mid and late 60s that you know having a beam axle and uh, and carburetors you know you needed to be you know hip and with it and you could probably drift easier with that could I, absolutely I remember years ago Mustang came out with an optional IRS couldn't give it away <laughs> because people they like to drag race it dump the clutch at the stoplight burn out you know and the independent suspension the live axle was better at that and uh, this is much like the, uh, the development of the MG when you saw from the uh, MGB to the uh, MGB C MGC and then ultimately the V8 uh, putting more and more power into these uh, chassis right. which they certainly could have handled the, the downside as it were is that as they progressed in power and perhaps chassis sophistication the aesthetic suffered greatly because yeah. these cars when they were first introduced in the early 1960s were so incredibly beautiful so typically British right then and they had the giant bumpers right. and they raised the ride height so, somehow the English management gave up you yeah. know they were so out of touch I remember reading when Honda invaded America and uh, England with bikes with electric starters and uh, leak proof engines and all that kind of thing I remember one of the head guys of British Leland saying that a motorcycles enjoy nothing more than decoking their head on a Saturday morning. <laughs> you know, taking the head off, decoking it, yeah. and putting it back, and that satisfaction of putting it back together. Not riding it. <laughs> you know, when I thought, God well, forbid. How out of touch. There you go. How out of touch could you possibly be? One thing I don't really care for is this Surrey top. Ah. I think in England it might have been because of weather, inclement weather, and it gets chilly and all that. But for California, this just seems, it seems like an air brake to me, doesn't well, it? It is interesting because uh, my TR4 also is a Surrey top car. And uh, it was actually uh, a an invention, an innovation by Michelotti, who first yeah. used it on the 1950s uh, small series production of Fiat for Vignale. Right. And it was really clever, and of course, as the Targa, 
uh, with Porsche, it became incredibly useful because you could stow the hardtop in your trunk right, right. and keep going. Here, the problem was that you had this great hardtop for when it was cold, but you couldn't actually store it in the car when you took it off. Right. And you had so, to bolt it off, right? And and you, the rear window was bolted to the body, so it's not about uh, the sort of Mercedes SL where you had this wonderful hardtop that right. you clipped down with four uh, connectors and lifted off when you wanted good weather, and you had a soft top to boot when you when you didn't have the hardtop on. So um, you know, for the English, of course, and you being half Scottish. Um, what's a little weather, you know, while you're driving your car? Right. So yeah. you have the, you have the top off, and it starts to rain or hail, and just sort of keep going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. You know, this is exactly the right size a car should be. This was normal size for a sports car when I was growing up. Now it's seen as a tiny car. It's, exactly. But it's really not. I mean, I have plenty of leg room. This seat actually goes back a little bit more. We've you, got shoulder room. Yeah, you could be over six feet tall and drive this thing no problem. My head's not sticking above the window, uh, the windshield rather. Uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful car for especially roads like this. When you're in New England, you have these little two lane roads. Boy, it's, it's with the speed limit comes down like 10 miles per hour. Normally it's 65. On these roads, you're 55 and you're actually hustling along a little bit. Yeah. Know? And the other thing was, uh, I was in the UK recently, and I know you've had this experience as well, and you see those sort of one and a half lane roads that fill uh, yeah. the UK, and you think, who the heck can drive on these roads? But they're made for cars this size. Right, exactly. There's a great deal to, to speak of when you talk about the tradition of the English sports car. <coughs> this is a very traditional English sports car. Just at the sort of the last moment that they were something that was acceptable and usable before things got sort of out of hand with. Uh, yeah, and here's the amazing part. Just three years earlier, all of a sudden you had roll up windows. Right. A top you can put up with one hand. I mean, they, these were like amazing innovations because sports cars were seen as. You know, windowless. They had the, the plastic inserts and the all that kind of stuff. And, uh, there used to be companies like uh, MG Mitten in California. I used to see their ads on the back of road and track cars. We could buy the string back gloves and all the little accessories <clears throat> to make your car you know, a little more. The Abarth exhaust. It all seems so exotic. Exactly. In fact, one of the first places when I came to California in the early 70s, I went over there. I'm going to go to MG Mitten. It's just a little tiny store. It went, it was like, I went, oh, I. I'm MG gonna, Mitten and Willem Hahn yeah, were like yeah. the dream catalogs. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, you know, the most exotic things. Yeah, I expected some huge emporium, you know. <laughs> but it's, um, it's a wonderful thing to be connected with and reunited with a classic. Something yeah. that, that exemplifies its type. This is the quintessential British roadster. And it also is a great lead-in to the house we're going to see today, which is a very traditional house in the most correct way, designed by one of the most important uh, designers and uh, architects of his time, and especially here in Newport, somebody who, who epitomizes the correct style, right. just like this. Triangle. And unlike this car, this house is big. <laughs> this is not some... It's so funny, the English love tiny cars and enormous homes, you know, <laughs> which seems sort of funny to me. So in America, we have the giant cars, cars. Yeah, and, you know, and people living in, you know, Levittown. <laughs> Today, this is Faxon Lodge, 1904, designed by Ogden Codman. Of course, everyone who watches this show recognizes that name immediately. He's the fellow who wrote with Edith Wharton the great book on decorating houses, the decoration of houses, the first time people had actually brought the art right. and science of decorating to the general public. And that's Ogden Codman. Ogden Codman. And he designed this house. He also, of course, did the interiors at the Breakers. Right, okay. But this home, he did not only the interiors, but also designed the exterior, 
for the architectural firm Peabody and Stearns. Did a lot of great mansions here in Newport. Right. And this was done for Frank Sturgis, who was a New York banker and former president of New York Stock Exchange, and later the first president of the Newport Historical Society. Yeah, I'm sorry, I must have dozed <laughs> off. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, well, it certainly is fascinating. Uh, uh, can we go inside and see what it looks like? Let's talk about the outside of the All house right. a little more first. Um, those who watched this series have also watched in, se in season one. Right. We visited Hope Dean. Yeah, Hope it's the home of Elizabeth Hope Slater Gamble. Right. And the Gamble family owned this entire stretch of land, uh, starting on Cliff Avenue, running for many miles over to Narragansett Avenue. And it was divided between the various members of the family. This was one of the plots that was sold off to a non-family member. So this is a part of that original plot. And it's also one of the few Newport estates that is still in its more or less complete form. So they took a gamble and sold it off. Let's go inside and have a look. That's right. <laughs> well, this is impressive. This is, again, the entry hall, the typical entry hall of an English hunting lodge. It's exactly what Thaxton Lodge is modeled after. Right. A Tudor English country lodge. Henry Fletcher, a subsequent owner of the home, was an ambassador to five countries. And as we will see in some of the other rooms in a moment, an international flavor was already introduced to this place. Now, one of the things that is very interesting about this as well is that it shows off the kind of detail that Ogden Codman was known for, and you see in his interiors at the Breakers as well. Yeah, there's it's a lot of Ogden Codman in here. <laughs> there is. The intricate carvings, the acanthus uh, detail on the top of the pilasters, the egg and dart around the, uh, the ceiling moldings. This is all very, very, very much in his style, and- And whose style was that? Ogden Cogman. Ogden Cogman, yeah. He was the co-author of what book? Oh, uh, The Decoration of Houses. The Decoration of Houses. Edith Ogden Wharton. By Ogden Cogman, yeah. Ogden Cogman and Edith Wharton, exactly. They were a terrific pair together. Uh, they toured the country, in fact, promoting the book. Really, really. Um, and one of the things that's very interesting about this home as well is, of course, that we have to thank Salve Regina University for frankly saving so much of the architectural history of Newport. Uh, when these very big houses had no use as family homes, they acquired many of them and this home was used as a dormitory for decades. And yet, under their care, it was, it was preserved amazingly intact. Yeah. Now, of course, there were things that uh, were lost to, to wear and tear and some subsequent additions. But if we just take a look over here on this table, Jay, you can see that the current owners had access to the original plans of the house, which aided the restoration immeasurably. And whose name was that on there? Uh, that would be Ogden Cogman. That, that's for, Ogden Cogman. For, for, for Frank Sturgis, exactly. Right, yeah. So Ogden Cogman for Frank Sturgis. Frank Sturgis, exactly. Well, oh, Frank Sturgis. Frank Sturgis. Okay. Now, this is my kind of room. The great room here is a very typical example of that of an English country hunting manor. The paneling, the, the expressive use of the wood in here, that wonderful fireplace with the, with the great fender. And again, yeah. here is a, is a wonderful example of how the owners were able to salvage and restore all of the original architectural details. Right, and you know, whenever I look at modern houses, especially in LA, they all look like hospitals for electronic equipment you know walls are white <laughs> and you have a big screen tv and it's not, i mean there's nothing like wood to make something feel like home. this is an enormous room it's bigger than any room in any modern house yet the wood makes it feel cozier makes it feel smaller it makes it feel friendly you don't feel like you're being dwarfed you know when i go to these houses they build in LA, they have these twin staircases and just acres of plaster it, they just don't have any character. All I in mean, white and gray. I mean, your eyes go to all the details in this room. I think you could, could come in this room a hundred times and see something new each time. Exactly. You know? And uh, again, this room has also been furnished with period antiques, correct to the house, with wonderful period paintings, uh, the stained glass uh, panels, and also 
the, the entire feeling of these small seating areas where people can have right. conversations or sit in the corner and read a book. But that's the kind of thing that, that you would want to have in your country house on the weekend. But you know, there's so many things that are like movies. When you watch a movie from the 20s, you can't watch it because it's slow, it's laborious. You know, this house is the way people still live. There's really nothing in here. If you told me this is all brand new furniture, I would believe you. You know, I mean, it all, it, it serves a purpose that is a perfectly functional bookcase that has a lot of nice um, woodworking in it. And, and uh, you know, it, it just, it feels like a house. I mean, houses can, you know, I, I remember seeing a picture of the, of the Stanley Brothers in 1903, parked in front of the house in Newton in their Stanley steamer. And then somebody recreated the photo in the 90s, even the early 2000s with the same car. And the house, everything looks exactly the same. The only thing different was the car. That's the only thing that it evolved. Everything else was still, because it's the best way to live, you know? <laughs> this, is, this is indeed a house that lives well. And one of the other things which is so wonderful about it is the fact that using the original plans, there was an addition on this side of the house that was fairly modern and not very characterful, a flat roof, not at right. all what you'd expect yeah. in a home like this. And it was taken off and it actually hid one of the original windows which was there, which was then restored. Oh. To make this a livable modern house, these are the original leaded glass paned windows, but they're now double pane, with right. an additional pane on the outside with UV coating to protect the furnishings and the artwork inside. And again, totally modern and up to date, but with the touch of the originality. Yeah, very good. The only thing missing, Odman Goodman. <laughs> Let's take another look at a room that has the wonderful touches of our friend, Mr. Codman. Oh, Codman Codman. So in this little reception room, you find some of those extraordinary decorations. All this decoration in the plaster, all original to the right. house, and all was here during the time that it was occupied as a dormitory, all painted out white, so it disappeared. Right, but right. It was all here ready to be rediscovered and, and But decorated. look at that ceiling, oh my God. It's absolutely extraordinary. And one of the other things which is wonderful about the way this home has been brought back is that some of the furnishings in this house also share its history with other houses in Newport. This table that we're in front of right now was originally at Champs Soleil, mm -hmm. another great mansion on Belgium. Well, it looks very, fr I know nothing about furniture, but this looks like French furniture. I don't know why, something about it says France of it to me, and, and it is obviously. I thought, oh, it looks very French, uh, just based on... The well, if you'd like a little, uh, that won't be too horrifyingly boring. Lesson in uh, furniture. These mounts, which are ormolu mounts, which are brass, mm -hmm. are very typical of French furniture, right. as is this particular type of marquetry decoration. So you only see this in French furniture of the 18th century, so it automatically says exactly what it is. Yeah. So you see, you're, you're very well trained, sir. Yes. Yeah. You will be a great apprentice to uh, Mr. Ogden Codman when That's he right. revives Well, I say, let's go get some French fries, huh? Yeah, come on. What are we driving next, Donald? Well, Jay, since you mentioned the spirit of France, right. we're going to do something that absolutely matches the spirit of French fries, right. which of course are American. A 1957 Chevy Bel Air. French fries are American? Man. French fries are fundamental. This is about as American as it gets. So going from the classicism of Facts and Lodge, to the classicism of a 1957 Chevy Bel Air convertible. I mean, when you, you talk to people who don't know a lot about classic cars, and you show them this, or, or, or they ask them about an, an American 1950s car, a lot of people will think of a car like this, or this car. Right, and the funny thing is, this car was not a success. This car, they've stuck fins on the back, because <laughs> Ford was out selling them four or five to one, and the 55 and 50 Chevys, although classically clean lines and attractive, 
it didn't pop like some of the Fords with the colors and all that from the 50s. So they put these fins on as a last ditch effort to, to grab some of that aerodynamic uh, space age stuff. And it worked, but it was still not a big seller. The thing that made these popular was second generation, the late 60s. Uh, you could buy these for 50 bucks, 100 bucks, put a big block Chevy in it or something, and make a really fast car out of it. It is bulbous to drive, isn't it? It's very, very funny because, you know, we have this conversation often about 50s cars, and they are perceived as these sort of very big, unwieldy, sort of wandering monsters. Um, and especially after being in the Triumph, <laughs> this yeah. certainly is a very different animal. But it's, uh, it's interesting because this car is, dare I say, sporting for one of its type. It's not the ultimate fuel-injected type. Uh, this is just a uh, four-barrel carb on the uh, 283. Um, but it does have a manual gearbox, a three-speed with overdrive, and uh, it is slightly more involving a driving experience than you might expect to get from a typical automatic 57 Chevy. Right, right. With power glide transmission. Um, but yes, this is definitely a cruiser. That's what it was built for and that's really what is best. To be here on a sunny day driving by a beach in this car seems perfect. But you know, you're absolutely right about how cars often that were not great sales successes become very prized as classics. Uh, you see that actually with the, uh, the Mopar uh, muscle cars. Right. They were never the big sellers and especially, you know, people talk about Oh, this car is so incredibly rare. It's incredibly rare because nobody wanted it when it was new. Right, right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But these became real cult cars and also uh, an example of how market shift. You know, these cars were very, very expensive in the collector car market about 20 years ago. Right. Uh, really driven by a big nostalgia wave. And uh, prices of these have softened considerably. Yeah, I remember the big thing was to put a big block Chevy in it or 350 or 327 mm -hmm. with fuel injection and headers and all. And they would go for 150 to $225,000. Exactly. Now, the big money is in a stock one like this as it left the factory. You know, the idea of, first of all, any one of those cars is not going to beat a McLaren or a Corvette <laughs> or anything. Right. So the idea that you've got the fastest car in the block, you're not even close anymore. So going back to stock, nice 283 either with fuel injection or manual gearbox, it's quick enough, and it's fun, and it's more nostalgia. Exactly, and the funny thing about this is too is that these cars are not slouches. No, it goes you know, good. It's a, uh, and you know, handling of course is a very relative thing, as you and I have often discussed about cars like this. These cars can handle if, once you get to know what it is they do, what their dynamic capabilities right. are. Uh, you plan ahead. There's a lot of, of dead space in the center uh, of the steering. And they are natural understeerers. They're designed that way for safety. Right, right. Um, and the funny thing is, when you get an on-ramp, if the on-ramp says 40 and you're going 41, <laughs> Buy his play tires a screeching, you know, and you go, geez. <laughs> exactly. It is, uh, and I, I always remember um, when I was watching TV as a kid, uh, and well before I certainly knew how to drive and knew anything about driving, I'd always wonder about, you know, Lucy and Ricky are driving to California in their and, they Catalina, like, and they're yeah. driving like this yeah. and saying, well, why did they do that? Well, you have to do a certain amount of mid-course correction on cars like this. Um, but I think that actually makes it interesting because, again, it's part of being involved in the driving experience. You know, these are not cars that drive themselves, um, especially in the manual versions. But, you know, you drive a car like this and you just think, again, I bring us back to classics and classical form. I drive the car, yes, I hear the engine, I hear the tires, I hear the wind noise, but I actually hear Dinah Shore 
Yeah, that's singing, right. Singing, see the USA in your Chevrolet. And I love the all-metal dashboard. Like, you, when you hit your head on this, it holds it off and sell it to somebody else. That's what happens. It holds it off, well, sell it to the next that's guy. That's why, again, Ford, and everyone said Ford is actually making a big deal about padded dashboards and all of that because they were selling safety at a time when they thought, oh, you can't sell safety because it implies your car is unsafe. Right, right. Well, you know, I remember Lee Iacocca came up with the idea of dropping an egg on the padded dashboard and it didn't break. And everybody was real impressed until they found out, oh, they were hard-boiled eggs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah this is also from a time when the GM ladder of brands was very, very, very strong. Right. And as fancy as the decoration is inside this Bel Air with this patterned uh, metal press dashboard and these seats with the uh, contrasting uh, embossed uh, pattern, what you got in the Pontiac or an Oldsmobile or a Buick was certainly miles ahead of this. I mean, you've got a contemporary Buick to right, this, right. and it's a very, very different animal. Right, right. So now that we've sampled this version of classic Americana, after a bit of classic English motoring, we're next going to go to the continent and see what the French have to say about yes, classic open-air motoring. Yes, and the French motoring. have something in common with this car. Now let's drive something which is Le Vrai France, the Delahaye. So, Jay, now we're in the French look oh. at classical motoring. Oh, so this is not a pre, this is different than a, uh, oh, well, I should be. You know, my card has a pre-selector. What you do is you pre-select the gear, and then when you want to shift, you push the clutch to the floor. This, you just, you don't need the clutch, you just, you just shift. Select the gear. Yeah, so it's, it, a Cotel is a little bit different, but we should explain what we're driving here. This is a 1951 Della A. 135M. 135M. Now, I have a 135S, which is the competition model. Uh, you know, it's interesting. This has very flamboyant styling. Ah, you think the styling is flamboyant? Well, that's, I think compared to American. Ah, okay. But I think it has a very dull engine. It's a six-cylinder with a two-barrel. It might as well be a Chevy 6 out of one of those masters, you know, the Chevy. I don't Men. think this engine is dull at all. It's incredibly engineered. It's very responsive. Well, I by, mean, by that I mean in an era when Bugatti had twin cam and uh, there all kinds of trick things going on. I remember when I got my 135S, it, it just looked like a Chevy 6, overhead valve, and very traditional, you know, nothing, nothing exciting about the engine. But that's why I think Delahaye found success in the late 1930s when it was eluding Bugatti in competition. It was the simplicity of the Delahaye and its reliability and power that allowed it to win at a time when the Germans were winning everything in the late 1930s right. because the most famous victory of Delahaye, a 1-2 in the 1938 24 hour of Le Mans. Right. And this car, this engine, this chassis is directly descended from that Le Mans winning car. But selling a car like this in America, when Cadillac had the overhead valve V8 and, and you just had a little wimpy six, it, it, I think it was a tough sell. It was an extremely tough sell at a time when Delahaye was desperate to sell cars in the U.S. Um, you know, after World War II, it was very, very difficult for all the manufacturers of cars. Everyone basically started with a reintroduction of their pre-war cars, mildly warmed over, and Delahaye, of course, is no exception. They started making this model in 1935. Right. And uh, they made it until 1954. And uh, especially, again, for the U.S. market, I happen to think this car is absolutely beautiful by one of my favorite coach builders, Henri Chaperon, 
with uh, uh, Paris. I agree, and it's beautiful, but when you really... It has a very pre-war look. It does. It's not 1951. 1951, you've got, from Italy, things like the Cisitalia and the launches that are, that are out in America. You've got the uh, wonderful, you know, think about a 1951 Cadillac and what that looked like. Well, in, in 1949, Cadillac was the best car in the world. Overhead valves a vacuum or electric windows, power windows, automatic transmission, radio, I mean all kinds of features that Europeans can only dream of. You know, Rolls-Royce still had a manual gearbox and a hand wind up down the windows, whereas Cadillac just pressed a button for everything. And it was uh, one of those things, of course, it was, there was a double penalty for companies like Delahaye. Um, because not only could they not effectively sell their products in the biggest and richest market in the world, the USA, but at home they couldn't sell them as right. well because the French government put very high taxes on large engine cars. You know, um, it, it's a shame because they used to say uh, Germany was the birthplace of the automobile, but France was the nursery where all the good ideas came from. System Panard and all right. kinds of things like that. You know, the French were wonderfully interested. Then the government just ruined it by, you can only build cars of two liter or less and they have to be able to carry eggs for the farm. You know, this whole socialist thing of, uh, we don't want fancy cars for rich people. So the technology just sort of stalled and France got passed by everybody. Exactly, and you think about the tradition of the French Grand Routier, yeah. the big, comfortable, fast, powerful car, right. which came back to France, ironically, in the late 1950s through the Fossil Vega, right. powered by a big Chrysler Hemi engine. Right. Um, well, that's when hybrid meant European styling and handling with American engine and transmission. Exactly. And it was a pretty good combination. Hey, guys because you got the American power and durability, and you fix it with a hammer, it was a Chevy or a Chrysler or something, you know. Uh, but you had the styling and the handling and the look of a European car. Not particularly fast, this is just a tour, well, or a grand tour, I guess. When we get a chance, it. just sort of put your foot in it, and I think you'd be surprised to see what this My car is. My foot's been in it for half an hour. <laughs> Again, um, class leading performance in 1951, absolutely not. Right. Um, but it's got a very, very flexible engine, I think. You know, this for a really this is side. a nice engine. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I find it's. To quote Rolls Royce, the power is adequate. Yes. It gets the job done. And of course, it also, one of the most dramatic things I think about this car is again related to the coach works and just gives you that feeling of a Le Mans car. Look at that hood and all those louvers. Right, right. I mean, it's just uh, it's just the coolest thing you could possibly imagine. Plus the idea that you're going to send a right-hand drive car in America. Good yes. luck. <laughs> but, you know, the, uh, they, they knew how to, it's the French interpretation as well of the English upper-class car. You've got this incredible book-matched wood yeah. paneling on the dashboard, on, on the door facings. And people forget the French did this kind of thing incredibly well. Right. We only think of English cars and think about this, but this is also very, very French. Think about the heavily lacquered uh, furniture. Right. French polish is what this wood has been treated to. Right. And uh, this wonderful 1930s art decoratif uh, chests of drawers and paneled rooms and all that. You feel like you're, 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 we're driving along in the SS Normandy. You I know. know. And what are we looking at here? Three and a half liter? Three and a half liter. Yeah. Um, and this is obviously the Bye -bye. mildest state of tune. So it's 130 horsepower, 130, so it's not yeah. a lot. Yeah. Uh, I think your car is 160. Right. Yeah. And the racing cars, I think, at 180. And again, you know, we are talking about national characteristics of cars. You mentioned the farmers uh, and the eggs, uh, but also the fact that the French were the first to have the route nationale, the, the paved state highways for right. uh, Napoleon to move his troops along. Right, right. Um, but they also specialized in very compliant suspension so that when you came to a bump, the car didn't shake. You know, the car right. absorbed 
the box. And I think that's one of the other things that gives this car its very distinctive character. French cars have always been the smoothest riding cars in the world. Whether it's Citroën or Peugeot. Or Renault, it's, yeah. it's uh, absolutely amazing. And it's sort of interesting too today that uh, at the heart of two of the largest automotive combines, when you think about what the car industry meant to, uh, to the UK, but that Peugeot with PSA Group, with Nissan, and uh, Renault with Stellantis um, are still parts of two of the biggest manufacturers of cars in the world today. Yeah. People are having such a big deal of driving on the other side, I don't find it difficult at all. No, I mean, it's, it's like second the, nature. It, it's especially helpful in terms of placing the car on the road. Yeah, yeah. Um, because you always know uh, where you are relative to the center of the road. But the challenge comes, of course, in a right hand drive car in a left drive environment if you're on a, a, a road you're passing. So to be able to see around another car to see if the road is clear uh, can be a challenge. But uh, again, this also has fender mounted mirrors which if aimed properly can help tremendously uh, in that aim. I always remember Delahaye's having translucent steering wheels, although this one is solid color. Right. Well, the translucent thing was really more of a pre-war thing than a post-war thing. Yeah. There are a few post-war cars that had that. That was very much sort of the Concorde d'Elegance uh, look. Um, I've had friends that have owned cars like this and taken them on thousand mile rallies like the Colorado Grand and things like right. that. And uh, it's strange to think because of this furniture and the way this, this uh, interior is arranged that these were practical long distance sort of businessmen express. Yeah, yeah. But it also I think has a lot in common with what we've seen in the interior at Faxon Lodge when you see what cozy, and I know this is something that's very close to your heart, this cozy wood environment, right, right. you know? Um, there's nothing about the, uh, the jet age uh, here in this 1951 Delahaye. So Jay, it's uh, time for you to uh, fill out my report card. Yeah. How tenuous has our classics connection been today? I, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not quite sure I see the connection, but it's, uh, and what was the connection again? We have classic forms. Right. Classic forms for a new life. So we see that classic form in the English style right. with the Triumph and with Faxon Lodge and with what Ogden Codman did in creating this wonderful English country home right. in Newport. Mm -hmm. Then we have the Chevrolet Bel Air, right. a classic 1950s American conveyance. And we have this classic French way of giving spirit and club-like atmosphere with a race car inspired engine. And I, all of this ties together. Yeah. I think the term I use, tenuous connection, says it best. Well, nonetheless, it's been a great day in Newport with it a has. fabulous house, three open cars and a perfect summer day. So there's nothing to complain about. No, nothing to complain about. But I'm sure you'll find something. <laughs> Not today.